afternoon, TLC. How's everybody doing? My name is Evan. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm on staff here, one of the servants of TLC. I take care of the, uh, the youth that tag the church. I'm just kidding. I don't take care of those ones. I make them into these ones who are holy and read the Bible every day, right? Anyway, uh, hey, thanks for coming out. Uh, for those of you who came out last night uh, to the baby shower, really appreciate that. Uh, in case you don't know, my wife, Ing, is uh, prego and uh, about to pop, so we, we do appreciate your presence and praying for us and well, your presence, meaning like you're being there and also your gifts. So um, thank you so much for that. Do you have some announcements? I guess I've turned into your weekly herald, apparently. Uh, they, they always appoint the best one, the best looking one, of course. So, so. Come on, you got to charm the people. All right, baptism class is today. Uh, if you don't know if you are committed or not, you better make up your mind because you only got about two hours. So maybe, maybe this message will really you know, move you to baptism class. You are not actually being baptized in the class. Okay, this is just to learn, get some information. What is baptism? Why are we doing this? What happens when we do get baptized? The actual baptisms are coming up very soon, okay, around, you know, the Christmas time, so, which is very soon. So baptism class today right here at 3.30. This Friday, uh, gift exchange, okay, you guys for, who go to the Friday night, the college young adult group, it is a $20 minimum. You guys go high end. So if you get a sweater, it's going to be a nice sweater. Uh, so, uh, $20 this Friday. Okay. Uh, it is at high and grace's house. Where's high and grace. They're not here. <laughs> I was going to ask them where they live. Okay. Just ask us, uh, just email. You can email, uh, at, uh, uh, email us. Yes. You can email us. Okay. Very good. We will tell you where it is. Facebook, Facebook. Very important. There's a joint service next week, 1030, 1030. There is no 1230 service. If you come here at this time next week, everybody will be eating and talking about what a wonderful service they had. So, Maybe you just want to do that. Don't do it, though. Come here at 1030. Joint service. Yes, there is translation. Okay, you do not need to sit there and be like, I don't know what they're saying. Okay, come here. There's translation. We're all together. It'll be fun. Uh, and that's about it for that one. Christmas Eve service. When is that? On Christmas Eve. Yes, very. I'm just checking, you guys. <laughs> Good job. I'm just making sure you guys know. Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve here. Seven? Is that at seven? It's usually on seven. Well, come around 7 and see what happens. All right. Again, there's translation. There's probably food after. All right. 7 o'clock right here. Christmas Eve. Young adults, uh, winter retreat is coming up. I know we all think, oh, it's next year sometime in January. That's very close. Okay. So mark your calendars now. Uh, Wearetruelove.com uh, slash winter retreat. Or just go and navigate our, our cool new address URL thing uh, and mark your calendar for that. Make sure to get registered. Finally, youth ministry is, uh, look. All right, look. I don't come up here every week just to do this announcement. It just happens that nobody has stepped up yet, all right? Nobody has stepped up. Tan has not stepped up. And I keep trying. I keep, did you get all the money that I sent as a bribe? Because I didn't send any because I don't have any. All right, Starbucks. Oh, thanks. That's a good one. All right, seriously, we are looking for a youth ministry leader uh, to step up. T. Elon, who is, uh, she was in the first service. She is stepping down for a little while because she's um, pursuing uh, higher academics, okay? Uh, she served for three or four years. I know they're big shoes to fill, but it's actually, it's not that bad, okay? You really, the, my, my, my qualifications are that you're, you know, you love Jesus, you want to serve, okay? Every Christian has a ministry. We've talked about this before. If you are not currently doing anything, think about it. Just pray about it. All right, and also you need to pass it like a drug test, okay? By the way, next week at 10.30, please be here at 10.30. Okay, they start on time, unlike us, okay? It's 1.15, this is the 12.30 surface, okay? Please be on time. We should, how many of you have a job? How many of you have a job? How many of you go to school or have been to school? Okay, you need to be on time for those things, right? Okay, God won't fire you, but still, you know, you should probably, yeah, yeah, let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you so much for this afternoon. We thank you so much for uh, just gathering us together as your sons and daughters. Lord, I pray that uh, this day your words will um, not fall lightly on our heart, that uh, we won't just easily forget the message, um, not only of the cross, but of whatever you have for us this very day, Lord. I pray that this will be a game changer for us. I pray that we step up in our commitment to you, Lord. I pray that you will speak through Tony, Lord, that you will open up our ears, open up our minds, Lord that you will prepare us for what you have and that uh, you will just remind us once again of uh, who is Lord, who is King in our life, who is God in our life. So 
we thank you so much. We commit this service the rest of our days to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I don't know, but I do enjoy when Evan gives announcements. They're, they're quite charming. It's easy to remember the stuff when Evan gives it. So thank you, Evan. Uh, welcome to TLC. It's good to see you guys. It's uh, always a pleasure. I got a good word for you guys today. The Lord is uh, um, going to speak. So let's, uh, let's get started. You know, um, how many of you guys are like Facebook hounds? You guys just go on Facebook for like reading other people's posts. How many of you guys do that? Don't lie. I know no one's raising their hand, but people are just like, ooh, right? Man, like my, my wife always gets so shocked when she posts something and nothing likes happens right away. I'm like, dude, people don't, like, are they on this thing like every moment? Like it just, she posts something and then likes like just happens, you know, like amazing. But, you know, Facebook, what does Facebook do? What is it that we post on Facebook? Why do we post? Partly because we want to tell people a little bit about ourselves. We want to describe who we are. We want to let people know what our likes, what our dislikes are. We want people to know, like, what our thoughts are, how we feel about things, you know. Um, we want to get people to have a glimpse into our personal life, or at least what we want them to see about our personal life. And what's the response? When people read it, they, they get a little big, they get a picture. They get a picture of, you know, so-and-so is like this, so-and-so apparently love dogs cause, or cats because they have all these mems of cats on their things. Or, you know, it's, it's just, you get, you get a picture of, of this person, a description of them. But then what usually happens? You just kind of just, okay, that's nice. You go to the next one, right? It's, you kind of just get it, information, and you kind of move on. Nothing very impactful, nothing very life-changing. No one really posts something that's like, whoa, I, I need to change my life right now, okay? Um, and so... Philippians chapter 2, the one we're at, it's kind of like a Facebook post. It is. It's a Facebook post from Jesus, kind of, right? Um, it's a description of who he is. It's, it's uh, into the mind of his motives, his thought process, his, his reasonings. Right? It gives us the mind of Christ. But the way God works, unlike Facebook, is that he doesn't just post for the sake of, oh, that's cute, right? We, I like that. Oh, Jesus, that's nice, right? The reason why he posts something the reason why it's written, the reason why it's, it's there, it's so that it will make an impact on our lives. The moment he posts it, the way he says it, it's meant to have this humongous impact on our lives. He doesn't just post it for the sake of it. He doesn't just post it for the fun of it. He posts it so that when we read it, it transforms us one way or the other. It has a humongous impact on us. It has to change us, okay? It's meant to change. So, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about a couple things in this post. We're going to talk, what does it say about Jesus? Understanding Jesus. And then secondly, right, how does, it, how does understanding Jesus then, what, what he wants us to know, how does that impact our lives? Right, how would that actually impact our lives? Facebook posts, people post for us to get to know them. That's how, like, I think, like, Facebook uh, cater uh, commercials or advertisements to us. Right? I think they, they, they have this crazy algorithm. I don't even know, but they have this crazy algorithm and they see what you like, what you don't like. They see what you read and what you don't read. And all of a sudden you get all these advertisements or these magazine articles that somehow cater to you. It's like, hey, I actually would read this. And you know, I'm like, I'm looking at my wall like, how did they know I would read this? This is pretty crazy, right? It's just, they do that because, you know, of the way you describe yourself. But unlike that, unlike that, Jesus posts something with this intention that when you read it, it's meant to impact your life. So we're going to see what he posts about himself, right? And then we're going to see how it impacts us, okay? Philippians chapter 2. Open your Bibles, uh, your pew Bibles. It's on page 819. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start actually at verse 5. I told him verse 3, but we're actually going to start at verse 5 today. Verse 5 to 11. And this is like one of the passages that like all seminary students just fall in love with because there's so much stuff. And like most, um, uh, most congregation gets really tired of listening to it because it's just so dense. So I'm not, I can't go through all the details because it will take like hours of preaching. And I know how much you guys love sitting through like hours of me preaching. But it's, uh, I'm going to focus on one part of what Jesus says about himself. And I'm going to share with you guys how that specifically impacts our lives. So you guys got to stick with me, okay? Understanding what it says about Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 5. Here we go. Your attitude... Your mind, the way you think, who you are, right? Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, right? 
your mindset should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. This is him describing. This is the post right here. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, to the glory of God the Father. Look at verse 6. This is what, it, this is what Jesus tells us about him. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped? What does this post tell us about Jesus? I know it's very anticlimactic after that huge introduction, but it tells us this, Jesus is God, right? And you're like, I'm, Pastor Tony, I already know that, right? Do you? Do you really know that? That Jesus is God, right? Do you, does that actually make an impact in your life? Because remember, God doesn't just post something for the sake of like, oh, that's nice. He posted it for the sake of impacting your mind, your attitude. It says that your attitude and your mind should be that of Christ Jesus. It's meant to make an impact on you. So the fact that I tell you that Jesus is God as the very first verse of this post, does it actually hit you yet? Okay? Let me break it down for you. How does this passage tell us that Jesus is God? How does it point to the fact that Jesus is God? What does this passage say that tells us Jesus is God? First verse, it says this, Who being in very nature God? The first thing in the word is the word nature. Nature. Nature means the essence of something. Right? It's much stronger. It's much stronger than the statement that says this. Jesus is God. If I just told you Jesus is God, that's not a strong statement. Because there's so much dynamics and wordings to the word God that people can get confused about that. Like Mormons say that we're all gods. Right? So what does that mean? Right? Or like, um, uh, yeah. Or the pantheistic Hinduism. They we're all part of God. Right? So what does the word God mean? So if, if you say that Jesus is God, that plays only a very small part. That plays only a very small part in the idea of what, what it means that when we say Jesus is God. It's not strong enough. Right? Don't you wish sometimes you read the Bible and you say, I wish that sometimes they would make it clear. Just say Jesus is God. No, that's actually not clear. This is a stronger statement. Paul is actually trying to make you understand this post. This is a very strong statement. It's saying that he had the very nature of God. Jesus has the unique qualities, the identical qualities, the substance, the characteristics. His very being is God. He's not a form of God. He's, not, he's saying the very essence of who Jesus is, the nature of him is God itself. You know, for example, uh, pyrite is fool's gold. You guys ever seen that? And then actual gold. See, fool's gold, it fooled people because they thought it was gold. It looked like gold on the outside. It um, had the shiny sparkling thing. It it looked sort of like gold, but it did not have the what? The essence of gold. The qualities of gold. The uniqueness of gold. It it wasn't gold. It wasn't real gold. It just had the appearance of it. So when people say, this is gold, is it? Is it really? How do you test it? You have to test what? The quality. The essence. That's how you actually prove it if it's real gold. And so when Jesus didn't just want to say, I'm God, that's too easy. What did he say? My essence is God. My quality is God. My very uniqueness, my very substance is God. Saying that I am God is too simple. It's not strong enough. He's trying to point it to your head. He's trying to shove it down into your mindset. Do you understand that I am God? I am God. I'm just, I'm, yeah. Okay. So the very first verse, he says the nature is God. How else does he, how else does this post tells us that he is God, right? Look what he says. The second part. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Some people would think that, okay, maybe there's a God and Jesus was a lower form of God. He was a lower form of a God. He's like a demigod. He's like a partial God. He's like Hercules. And then, you know, God is Zeus. You know this? No. To make it even clearer, the post says, I am of equal standing of God. I'm of equal standing with God. 
There is an equality between me and God. There's not an upper echelon and lower echelon of God. I am of equal substance, quality, uniqueness, being, characteristic, essence of God. Okay? You guys following me so far? Jesus is God. That's what he's trying to tell you. I'm trying to make you guys understand this very clearly because the impact is going to be big. Okay? So let me build it up for you guys. The impact is big because if you understand that Jesus is God, the impact is going to be humongous. Here's a third reason why this post points to why Jesus Christ is God. Okay? Some people would say, modern people would say, you know, Jesus Christ isn't, wasn't really God. He didn't actually believe that he was God. Actually, the original people that followed him didn't even believe that he was God either, right? It was actually after legends, years on of teaching and passing it on, that people began to think that Jesus was God. He wasn't really God. But you know, the very way in which God or Paul wrote this post, right? I keep calling it a post, but, but you guys get what I'm saying, right? The very way in which Paul wrote it, the unique way in which he wrote it points to the fact that he's saying Jesus is God. You know why? Isn't, if you see in your Bibles, you guys have your Bible, that's why it's really cool if you have Bibles. Um, the way from verse 6 to 11, it's written differently, isn't it? It's kind of like a little poem, poem kind of form. It's not like a straight paragraph form. It's very poetic looking. Do you know why he wrote it like that? Because he was quoting someone. This was a quote from a poem, a hymn that Christians were already singing, that they knew about. You guys get that? He was quoting something that they knew about. So that they, the moment he wrote it, they would say, oh, I've sung that before. Oh, I've read that before. Oh, I know what he's talking about. It was to remind them, right? The way in which he wrote it, okay, the way in which he wrote it shows us actually that Jesus is God. You know why? Because this, the book of Philippians, the book of the Philippian book, letter, I'm all tongue-tied. I'm so excited, right? <laughs> the letter to the, Philippi, to the Philippians was written 20 years after Jesus. So if it was written 20 years after Jesus, that means this quote, this song, this poem came what? Way before that, right? Way before to the original believers. The original believers, the ones who saw Jesus, understood that Jesus was God. It wasn't something that happened afterwards, 100 years after Jesus' death. This quote came from the very beginning. They, they said that the very nature of God, not considered equality with God, something like that. it was a poem, it was a song that the Christians were already singing about from the very beginning, right? He picked this very specifically so that they'd be reminded of that, right? You know, it's like, for example, when I, um, my mom's birthday, I posted that, uh, a lyric from Tupac song, Dear Mama, right? Who got that? Who, who got it before I wrote two, Tupac? Thank you, right? Like, it was lost on the, the kids. I was like, who's, who's? I had to write Tupac at the end because I was thinking, none of the kids would know, okay? But, like, the, the, the goal was when I wrote it, I was, I was trying to imply, I hope you guys understand what I'm, who, who it came from and for you to remember, oh, yeah, I know that song, right? Same way when Paul wrote this, he was trying to gauge the memories of the people. Say, oh, I know that. And for us, when we read it, it actually points to something very dramatic. If this was written, if this letter was written 20 years after Jesus, and this quote came before that, you know what that means? That means that the people who saw Jesus, they believed that he was God. They knew that he was God. Even more, Jesus claimed that he was God. You know why? Because if Jesus never claimed that he was God, and all of a sudden all these people start singing a song about God, they would have said, uh, Jesus never said that, fool. I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all's lying. You know, why are you singing this song? He never said that he was God. Wrong, right? No one ever came up, which tells you what? Tells you what? That this very, from the very beginning, the original believers in Jesus himself said this. I am God. I am God. I'm not a figment of your imagination. I'm not a great man. I'm not just a teacher. I'm not just a philosopher. I'm not just a good dude. I'm not just one of those revolutionaries. I am God. I claimed it. Okay? I claimed that. And you imagine... Jesus doing this? Because out of every group of people at that time, the, the, the Greeks, the Romans, um, Egyptians, all that group of people living at that time, the one group that would never believe that God can become man, you know what that one group of people are? Are the Jews. They believe that God exists in this huge form, that he's, he is beyond thinking, he, he is out of this world, that he is not of, of this reality. There's no way that God will become man. And yet, who were the people that were singing this song, saying, who being very nature God, did not consider equality with God, 
something to be grasped. You know who it was? It was the Jewish people. You know why? Because Jesus lived in front of them in such a way. Can you imagine the, way he, the man that he must have been for the Jewish to actually get rid of their understanding of who Jesus is and of who God is and said, this man must be God. This man has to be God. The miracle that he's done, the things that he's taught, the way that he says it, this man must be God. The original believers, based on the way Paul posted this, was to show you that God, that Jesus claimed himself to be God. Okay? It's huge. Jesus Christ is God. This passage points three ways into which it makes that point clear. Jesus Christ is God. That's good. Pastor Tony, I knew that from a long time ago. You didn't have to tell me, right? But let me ask you this question. If that is the truth, if that's the post that Jesus wants to let you see, if that's the description that he's giving to you, right, then he didn't just do it for the fun of it. He did it to do what? To make you have an impact in your life. It had, it's there so that it would impact your life. The reality of that truth is meant to impact your life. It's meant to actually do something to your life. It wasn't meant to just like, oh, that's a nice post. Click next, right? Who's next posting, right? Muhammad, that's great, right? No, no, it's meant to really impact your life. How does it do that? Right? If Jesus Christ is in your life, if Jesus Christ is in your life, we need to be more optimistic. We would actually be more optimistic about life instead of so pessimistic, wouldn't we? The impact in our life is that we would actually be more optimistic instead of so pessimistic. We wouldn't be so stressed out about our future. We wouldn't be so depressed about what's to happen. We wouldn't be so upset about the situation of our current life right now. We would be very optimistic about it because why? Jesus is God. And if he is in me, he is committed to me. If he is in me, he has promised to never leave me nor forsake me. He has committed himself to me, then why is my life not having any impact? You know why? Do you know why your life is not having any impact or change even though you claim that Jesus Christ is in your life? Because your mind is not like that of Christ. Your attitude is not like that of Christ. Look at verse 5. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. You don't have the same attitude nor the same mind set as that. Right? Right? Look at Paul. Paul was unthinkable, right? Paul, 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 the love that God, Paul had for God was unthinkable. He, no matter if he was beaten, no matter how bad things got for him, no matter how good things got for him, no matter where he was in life, no matter, no matter that he's actually in jail, being chained to a dude for 24-7, it didn't matter to him. He wasn't pessimistic about his future. He wasn't depressed about why things aren't happening the way he thinks they should be happening. He wasn't stressed out about why things are going. He was optimistic about it. This whole letter is about joy. He's trying to get the Christians to understand that the Christian life is a life of joy. And the fact that you are so pessimistic about your future and about your current life right now, the fact that Jesus reality that he is God has not made an impact on you is because of your attitude. Your attitude is not like Christ. Your mindset is not of that Christ. And because your attitude and your mindset is not like that, there is no impact. You sit around depressed. You, you, you always whine about why things aren't happening for me like they should be. Why things aren't going for me like the way they should be. Right? You think that everyone is against you. But if Jesus is God, and that's what he's posting, that's what he's saying. He said, listen, church, listen, church. This post is not for fun of it. This post is to make you see something. I am God. But even more than just, my nature is God. My essence is God. I am of equal standing with God. Do you know who I am? I am God. And if I am God, why is your life not changing? If I am God, then why is Why is your life not having any impact? If I am God, then why are you living? Why are you living as if I'm not existing? Why are you living as if I have never promised you that I'm going to be with you? Why are you living as if I am not committed to you? Why are you living in such a pessimistic, depressed, stressed out state? I am for you. That's the impact. 
know what the other impact is? There's three impacts. Let me the second impact here. The second impact that this post was meant to make to believers is for us to act in one extreme. It's for us to become one extreme or the other. It's becoming one extreme or to respond to Jesus in one extreme or the other. Jesus says, I am God. Holy moly, are you for real? Are you really the God who has made everything? Right? One extreme is saying, I don't believe it. You're crazy. I don't believe it. I'm done. Right? I'm out of this church. But the other extreme is, are you really? Are, are you really God? Then my life should center everything around you. And who I am is devoted to you. Who I am it needs to be given to you. Every thought process, my life, my future, my relationship, everything is centered around you. It is never meant, this post was never meant for you to be dancing in the middle. It's never meant for you to be like, oh, I like Jesus. Like, right? No. It's not for you to have a like button. It's for you to be like devotion towards him or total rejection of him. Either he is completely real and you have given your whole entire life for him or he is false lying and you just walk away from him. But it's never meant for you to be dancing in the middle saying, oh, I kind of like Jesus. I just want to chill in the world for a little bit. But I'm a little, I, I'm, I'm down with God. I just want to have fun, but I also want to do this in my life. No. See, when Jesus posted, hey, do you know who I am? If you realize and you understand who I am, you have one or two extremes to move towards. Either you totally reject me or you're all in for me. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. Right? We're called to be totally devoted or utter rejection. Is that you? Is that the impact of Jesus Christ who's in you, as you say? Is that you? Is that the reality? If Jesus is God and he's claiming it in this post, my nature, my essence, my quality, I am God. It points to it. That's the reality. Then how come your life is not having an impact? That should impact your life, shouldn't it? Right? It should impact the way you think about the future. It should impact the way you live now. But here's the third part, okay? Third part is this. This should also impact the way you deal with people. It should give you a whole different dynamic to the way you treat people, right? How does that work? I have to explain something first before I can get to that point, right? If Jesus Christ is God, it gives you a different dynamic into the way you treat people. Because remember, joy, chapter 2 is about joy and dealing with people, and the reason why we don't have joy a lot of times is when we deal with people, they take our joy away, don't they? Right? And so this right here, this last point is really to get to you to understand that, how it affects the way you interact with people. Jesus being God. Do you know when Jesus claims that he is God, do you know what that points to? It points to this, this doctrine, this, this teaching of what we call the Trinity, the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three people, one essence, one God, right? Don't ask me to explain it, okay? Not today, right? At least it'll take me a while. If you ever, if you have a question about it, I, I can give you a road map to, to kind of maybe wrap your head around it, but I can't really explain it clearly. I can give you a good road map though, right? But not today, okay? But the idea here, the idea is if Jesus is saying, I am God, then it points naturally to the idea that there's Three persons, one essence. This is God is this Godhead is three in one. You know why that's important? You're like, why is that important? Why is it? Why is the Trinity so important? Why can't we just have one? Why does why does God have to make it so complicated? Why does it have to be three in one and yet one is three and why does it have to be like that? Do you know why? Do you know why that our God is not just one person? Do you know why it's not like Muhammad being one God? Do you know why it's not Judaism, Jehovah being one God, just one by himself? Do you know why? Because a God like that, a God who is just one person, a God like that is defective. It's defective. He's a defective God. Do you know why he's defective? Let me break it down, okay? Hang in there. He's defective because this. This God 
You will have a God who has never known love, who has never loved anybody until he actually created something. This God by himself has never known love until he has created something, right? He has never been in a relationship until he has created the heavens, the earth, angels, humans. He has never known love or relationship until he's created something. And it points to even more defectiveness. You know why? Because this God was a God who created in order to meet love, in order to meet his personal need for love. He created for his personal love need. That's a defective God, right? That's a, that's a selfish God. That's a God that's self-focused, not the God of the Bible, not the God of the Christian Bible, not the God of the biblical truth. You know why? Because from the very beginning, he's always been in relationship. He's the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He didn't create because he didn't have a relationship and he wanted it. He didn't create because he was in need of someone to love him. He created to give love. He created to give love. That was the whole part. He already had really. He was in perfect relationship. And so from that point, his creation was meant so that they can experience love. When Jesus Christ came and he stepped down from the very essence of the Trinity and he stepped down as a man, he didn't step down as a general. He didn't step down as a soldier. He didn't step down as a politician. He didn't step down as someone to receive. He stepped down as the Bible said what? Made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He stepped down to be a servant to give love. To give love. Because he's already experienced and know the very depths of it. When he deals with us, it is meant to give love, regardless of whether we choose to give love back. It is meant to give. He's not seeking for the love in return. You guys follow me? Right? And so when we begin... As a people, how does this impact us to deal with people? When we begin our relationship with Jesus, we begin with this triune God, this relationship that we have, and we engage in other people, we begin to engage in a selfless matter, not a selfish matter. Let me give you an example. Unless you start with God, unless you actually start with God, if you start to engage in helping and serving and counseling, and taking care of people by your personal self, unless you start with a God like that, you know, whether you know it or not, you are seductively manipulating yourself, right, to meet your personal love need. The reason why you love sometimes, the reason why you give, the reason why you give your heart and your energy is ultimately seductively manipulating, even though you don't maybe intentionally say it, It's actually to meet your personal love need. How do I know this? How do I know this? When they don't return your love, how do you feel? When they aren't grateful for what you do for them, how do you feel? When they begin to reject you or yell at you or unthankful, how do you feel? Right? Don't you feel snubbed? Don't you feel jaded? Don't you find yourself thinking, I'm not going to help you next time. Forget that. Right? Right? You know, this year's gift, yeah, for you. Next year, no, 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 right? I ain't giving you nothing next year, right? Don't you get upset? Don't you find yourself controlling the situation, manipulating people so that they will treat you the certain way? And you're thinking, oh, I'm just trying to be nice. I'm just trying to do things correctly. You know what you're really doing? You're trying to meet your personal love need. You're actually being selfish, It looks good. And I'm not going to say that being nice has no good values. Of course it does. Right? You're going to care for people. It has inherently good value. But the ultimate purpose, the ultimate reason, the ultimate thing and why you do something is to fulfill your personal love need. And you know that. That's why when you deal with people, it's good as long as they treat you well. But the moment they what? A confrontational with you, the moment when they begin to argue with you, the moment when they just piss you off or annoy you, right? How do you react? Do you react in a way that says, oh yeah, it's okay. My love was meant for you. I don't want anything back in return. It doesn't matter if you don't say thank you. I'm okay with that. Or are you like, back of your head, make sure you don't deal with this person next time. 
make sure you don't try to try so hard with this person next time. This person is a lost cause. I don't want to deal with that anymore. Don't you feel that way? Don't you act that way? And the reason why is this. Unless you have a God, a triune God who has known perfect relationship from the beginning, and your bottom line, your identity, your significance, your value, who you are, is based in Him, right? unless, that's, unless you're based in Him, right? you're going to go out seeking to find your own personal love need. But if it is based in Him, you go out loving people. You choose to love people. Right? That's why I keep saying, love is a choice. You choose to love people. And the only reason why you're able to choose to love them is because you know that there has been a choice and love has been given to you. That's why in marriage, marriage is so beautiful. It's so beautiful when it's done under God. Because when a marriage is done under God, it is you to God that you connect with. And when your spouse, your husband, your wife are having a bad year, when they're just not producing, when they're just not being kind, when they're just being annoying, when they're just being upsetting, when they're just not appreciating you, you can still give love. You're not expecting them to love you back. You're not expecting them to return this love, but you can give love. Why? Because your love becomes a choice rather than a need. You guys get that? Love becomes a choice that you can give rather than a need that you have to have. Your kindness becomes a choice rather than a need. What you do becomes a choice rather than a need. But it starts with understanding that Jesus is God. That Jesus is a God that existed in perfect relationship. That he has come down here and the way he exists, he creates to love, to let us experience love. When Jesus Christ came down, he came to give us love. Not to seek for a need in return. He has no need of us. God has no need of us. His desire is for us to experience love. But it starts with understanding this post. Understanding what Jesus is saying in this post. You know what he's saying? Shock to the world. I am God. I am God. I am the triune God. I am God. My very nature is God. That should blow your mind. That should blow your mind if you're a Christian. That should give you such a sense of peace if you're a Christian. That should give you a place of joy to walk towards if you're a Christian. Because why? All right? If God, if Jesus Christ is truly God, then he is committed to me. Then my future, my presence, wherever I'm at, He's for me. And if he is for me, the Bible says, who is against me? Right? So what does Jesus say that he is? He is God. What impact should that have on our lives? What impact should that have on our life? We should be less pessimistic and actually more optimistic about life. Two, our life should actually show an extreme. Right? We are for God. Everything we do is centered around God. Right? Or we are just totally rejecting him. And three, the way we treat people, the way we choose to love is totally different. Totally different. Right? You see this a lot. You, you see this added to that. You know, during, during like uh, gift exchanges, right? You know, gift exchanges, you know, white elephants. You know, sometimes people don't give, like, they don't actually go and buy a $20 gift. They just kind of find it somewhere. And then don't you get upset when you get their gift, right? Don't you get upset? You know why you get upset? Because you're thinking, oh my gosh, I gave so much, right? My gift is so awesome. Why did I give such a crummy gift, right? Don't you feel that way, right? You know why you gave? You gave because you wanted something in return. You wanted something of equal value in return. And when you did not get something of equal value in return, you were upset. Rather, Christmas should be about, I'm just going to give, and I'm just going to be happy that I'm with my brothers and sisters. And if they choose to snub me on a gift, it's cool, right? Because my identity, my joy, my essence of love is not founded in this gift. I don't have a need for love. I already have love. I don't have a need to feel significant. I already, I already know that I'm significant. Because why? My bottom line, my source of hope, my significance comes from Jesus Christ. Lord, Savior, God. That's huge. That's huge. But I know some of you guys are thinking, you know, sometimes still told me, I don't have a, I don't know if I can have a heart. 
right? What's going to motivate me to have that heart? What's going to push me to have that heart? Let me read this last part for you, okay? And this is the gospel. And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus Christ, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How do I get this motivation to choose to love? Tell me. How do I get this motivation? I understand that Jesus is God. Boom. Shocker. Game changer, right? Huge. I understand that my, the reason why my life is not of impact, that I'm, I'm, more, I'm still pessimistic and not as optimistic, the reason why I don't um, treat people well is because my mind, my attitude is not that of Christ. But how is, it, how is it to get, how do I get there? How do I get that motivation to do that? How do I get that heart? Jesus became man. Do you know why he became man? He, why didn't he just save us as God? Why wasn't he just stay transcendent God and find a way to save us, right? Why did he have to become man to save us? Why did he have to step down from divinity into humanity to save us? He took on flesh so that you would understand that your fleshly life, this period that you're living in, matters. That it is redeemable. That your life is redeemable. That who you are is redeemable. That your life has significance. That it means something. That you do matter. That's why he took on flesh. He took on flesh to show you that life matters. And he will do whatever it takes to make sure you understand that your life matters. So much for, so much that he would actually do what? He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He would die so that you would understand your life matters. It matters to him. It matters to the one who has made you. He didn't make you so that you would love him. He made you so that you would experience love. And the only way that he can know that you can experience love is that he had to come down, redeem life, and to show you that you matter. Do you realize that you matter to God? Do you realize that your life does have significance? I know that some of you guys are in a rut right now. Usually when you finish college, you stay in a rut for a while because you're trying to figure out your career, trying to figure out where you're going with life, trying to figure out what things are going. And you, you're in a little rut. You're in a little kind of like a plateau. Some of you guys may be going down. And you feel like, does my life matter? Am I going anywhere? Is this, is this, does this mean anything? What's this whole purpose of all this? He came to tell you your life matters. That you are significant. And when you see that, when you look upon the God-man, Jesus Christ, God, you realize you are God. And you realize my life does matter. I need to stop being so pessimistic about it. And just to trust and to step out, to take risk. And whatever happens, happens. All right? Paul says, I know the secret of being rich or poor, fed or hungry, right, sick or healthy. I know the secret of all. You know what the secret is? Jesus Christ, God. God became man to make sure that you know that you are significant. When you grasp that, guys, when, you, when, that, when that post hits you, when that coin drops in the metaphoric life of your machine machine of life, right? You will get the fact that what? Right? Your life matters. Jesus Christ has come to redeem you, right? He wants you to know that he is God. He is committed to you. Right? So stop being so pessimistic. Stop being so pessimistic, distressed, stressed out. He's committed. And if he's committed, if he's for you, who can be against you? Right? Take that. Take that love and begin to live it out for people. Let's bow our heads. Let's come before the Father in response. Can we respond to him at this time? Can we just come in prayer? Can we come maybe as a prayer of repentance, right? Lord, why is my why is my heart so 
distressed. I'm always worried. And I don't sense joy. Can we come? Can we begin to pray this prayer? Lord, can I have your attitude? Can you give me your mind? May I understand you. May my mind and your mind be like one. Can you show me more than in words, can you show me in such a way that my life will change forever in the knowledge that you are God. Change my attitude this day, oh God. Change my mindset to you. Can you come and pray that prayer before the Lord? Let's come. Let's set that up before God. Let's pray. God, we come, first and foremost, we just declare how wonderful, how amazing, and how crazy, how crazy it is, the reality that you are God, Jesus. You are God. Father, my prayer is that you will begin to change the attitude and the heart and the mind sons and daughters of TLC. The Father God, instead of being pessimistic, downtrodden, broken, joyless, depressed, stressed, the God, that there will be joy in our lives because you are God. And Jesus, there will be optimism in our life because you are God. That there will be wonders in our life because you are God. That there will be hope in our lives because you are God. I pray, Lord, that you would change our hearts and our attitude in such a way that we learn to love people, not to fulfill some sort of personal love that we, that we have, but that we will love people because we choose to love them, regardless of whether they love back, regardless of whether they're grateful or not. We will choose to love because from you, we learn that you are God, and that is beautiful. That you are committed to us, that you are for us, that you are not against us. May this day, and as we celebrate the Advent of you becoming man, may we just realize how much we matter to you, how much our life matters to you, and how deep far you would go to make sure we understand that we matter. So Lord, help us to come honestly, honestly before the cross. Lord, may may our lips truly declare that you are God. May our mind and our attitude change because of that. We love you. We thank you. We pray all these things.